is a special day because we have uh, three guests very important as Tracy Holmes, as Louis Miles, and uh, Louis Johnson. They are the top because they were on the top also of our award. And uh, now I think that uh, I have to leave to entertain for this show to Tracy Holmes, that is much better than me in speaking in English and in everything. Tracy, she is the queen of all the microphones. Tracy, now I will show the first trailer and after you will begin your part. The Springboks are now world champions. With this extraordinary victory, it would not have been possible without a protest movement that started 50 years ago. A movement that changed forward in South Africa and helped bring down the racist regime. To stop the threat was terribly important. We were striking a blow against the very foundation of apartheid. BT Sport Films presents the incredible story of that struggle. Stop the tour, only on BT Sport. Okay, now to you, Tracy. To you Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianni. And um, I'd like to bring in straight away Louis Miles, who made that documentary that we just saw the snapshot for. And I hope everybody's been able to see um, the trailer or learn a little bit about um, the movie uh, in order for us to be able to discuss it tonight. Um, Louis, are you here? I'm here. Yeah, great. Look, uh, this is so important because um, in storytelling, and this is the business that all of us are in, it's so important to pick the moment, isn't it? And to be able to, to put that onto a screen or to put that into a microphone or to write it into words. How do you decide what is going to make a powerful and um, compelling story that reaches across the globe? Um. So I think it's largely about context and what's the wider story um, behind what's happened. Um, I guess with something like Stop the Tour, when we first started to want to tell the story, there was no real, apart from it being a 50 year anniversary, a lot of broadcasters weren't necessarily interested because it happened so long ago that a lot of people didn't know about it uh, or didn't remember it, including myself. I didn't know anything about it before uh, I met um, Peter Hayne, who's the lead um, activist uh, and went on to be a government minister in the United Kingdom. Um, and it opened up my eyes and I thought it was incredible. Um, BT, luckily for us, BT Sport um, saw the value in it and we started making it. And then it became really relevant because South Africa won the World Cup um, just as we were finishing the film. And um, that team couldn't have happened without um, all, of, all of the work that was done by the anti-apartheid protesters worldwide, but specifically, I think this campaign, um, because you wouldn't have had a multiracial team lifting the World Cup if the protests uh, to stop um, apartheid hadn't have happened within sport. Um, other factors came into it as well, of course, there's, there's things like financial pressure, um, uh, and, and statecraft, but I mean, ultimately this protest movement hit um, South Africa where it really hurt. It was their major cultural pastime and by stopping them playing, they couldn't express themselves. Um, and also sport is very much a, a big PR uh, tool for, for, for states around the world. Um, and so by, if you think about it, a, a South African team coming to town and showing how good they are at rugby gives them very positive stories. Um, whereas obviously it wasn't going too well back at home. So I saw, I mean, I, I, I like stories that have a deeper context. I mean, I, um, you know, have, I, I started off as a, a sports producer and I've done a lot of advertising and I still do advertising now. Um, but you know, there's, that's things about looking cool and being cool and all the rest of it. But the real stories that make an impact are the ones that have that, deeper deeper meaning whether it's in a political sense like this or there's a big personal journey that have gone on a, you know a good human story behind what's happened and and i think this this one really had that 
Um, you talk about that human story, and that's the thing that connects us all, isn't it? It's that uh, emotional pull. It's walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. It's understanding how that one pivotal moment, and like you say, this is the game of rugby that many people in the world can relate to, the same as any other game of, of cricket or basketball or soccer or pick whatever you like. It's it's people contesting themselves against somebody else. But in this instance, like you say, it changed the course of history. And if it wasn't for people like you documenting these sorts of stories, that history can be forgotten, can't it? A hundred percent. And look, I'm, I'm very much an example of that because, it, I mean, I've worked in rugby on and off for 10 years and I've covered Six Nations events. And for those of you who are in uh, maybe South America or USA don't know anything about rugby that's kind of the the key event uh, or the key competition in rugby is in the northern hemisphere it's a massive massive thing um, and I knew a lot of the players I knew I knew a lot of the Springboks teams from various things that I've covered with them um, but I didn't know about this because it was I mean I was born in 1983 and this happened um, you know sort of 14 years before I was born so I didn't have any cult and it's a really good example of how quickly things move on and then if you don't keep on telling these stories they do get do get forgotten especially in the last 10 years when so much has happened in the world uh, there seems to be a massive news story every day which didn't seem to be the case when I was growing up I think but um, um, so it is really really important to keep on telling these things because it does become relevant um, uh, you know in the future you know, but there's, I think it's a famous book from W.E. Carr, which is What is History? And history does kind of repeat itself. The same things happen again and again and again. They're just different people, but the same motivations are there. Um, and and look, look be, be in no doubt, sport is bigger than just the event itself. It's, a, it's our cultural, uh, you know, it's one of the major cultural expressions that we do as a society. It brings people together. It's something that is a pastime that everyone watches and so it can be manipulated politically or it can be um you know cause for great great celebration it can really unify people um you know we had the london olympics here and i can't remember a more unifying moment for the country um it's certainly not been that way since and and um so you know the it is so important and that's why these stories are, are great to make and why i'm sure everyone on this call uh, has ideas about what they want to make in the future and why you should explore all this stuff because you know if it's especially if it's not been told already or if it hasn't been told for a while that's that's your kind of job as a storyteller to, to provide an angle to it that makes it relevant or to make it compelling for an audience. Is, is that the trick and that's what I'll ask you as my final question to you is that the the trick that you'd like to leave everybody with today is to find that unique story or even is it to find a story that may have been told in a hundred different ways before, but if the journalist or the reporter with their own unique voice thinks that they can bring another dimension to it, is that the trick as well? I think it's a mixture of both. So um, I, I, I get offered a lot of stories now because I've made a few feature documentaries and feature films, and a lot of them I turn down because I can't see a story within there and I can't, um, I can't, you're only as good as the materials that you are, right? So, um, you know, it's all very well saying I've made X and you can give me anything and I can make it good. Well, you can't if there's the, if the elements of the story aren't there, you know. Um, I think a good example is I made a film last year for um, the BBC about Liverpool winning the Premier League. And normally that's a story I'd turn down because I've made a lot of football content in my time. Um, I find current day stories about um football a bit dull for that sort of length i mean i make a lot of shorter than shorter versions of this stuff you know sort of a lot more sort of more creative more kind of glossy um but that's fine that's a different context but for something like this um you know say if manchester city had won it or manchester united i probably would have turned it down because i couldn't see the wider context it's just okay they've won it they were good this year whereas with liverpool there's a lot more emotion uh, wrapped up um, within the winning of that title because Liverpool had uh, have been through some terrible tr trouble as a city and as a football club, obviously with Hillsborough, the, the stadium disaster in 89 and Heisel in, in 86. 
And I, I looked at it and I thought, well, I don't, I mean, this story has been written about, but I don't think it's gone across in broadcast. Um, just quite the fallout of that and how that's relevant to now and, and tying it all together. And, we, and it was called the 30 year wait and the BBC were really kind of keen. They wanted it to be made like this because we knew there was going to be a lot of other documentaries coming out about Liverpool winning. And um, I think pretty much all of the other ones um, were just about the season and about how great Jurgen Klopp is. And I, I, I didn't really care about this year's team at all. I did care about the journey from, you know, Liverpool were really great. It all went wrong. And then they had to find a way out of it. And they got it wrong largely for very, very many years. They had moments of success. And then um, in, a, in a weird way, the last sort of eight years or so has been um, almost like a third act in traditional storytelling where they finally got, they professionalised. And it was, and it really is about a club trying to work out what its identity is in the modern era, um, post Premier League coming in, post all this money coming into football. Uh, and there was a real story to tell. So I think, um, that's that's an example of taking something that has been told and, and, and charging a different story within it. But then obviously you could do that because those elements were there. So um, yeah, it's a mixture of both. But I mean, you know, unique stories are, unique stories are fantastic. There is also a problem with getting it away and getting it broadcast and made, whether you've got to raise finance or get it commissioned, because quite often a lot of commissioners want something that they can easily put into a box and just fill TV schedules which is a tricky thing to fight against. But over time, as you develop your, your storytelling abilities and make, make things, that becomes a bit easier. Louis, that, that's fantastic. And that is such great advice because, as you say, there's a temptation. Um, bosses can sometimes want stuff that fills, that fills up the time, and none of that is memorable. You know, that's kind of here today and gone tomorrow. And so being able to develop your own voice as you have done, and then to have that reputation enables you um, to focus on the greater stories and, and continue to, to rise up. Thank you for that. Gianni, did you want to introduce the next speaker? Now, uh, I would like to, to call Mr. Lewis Johnson. Lewis Johnson, uh, let me... Uh, ciao, Lewis, how are you? Ciao, ciao, Gianni. So the, the most important thing is that uh, to introduce him, I have to tell something about him, because when I knew him the first time, it was, uh, I think that was after the Olympics in LA. And this guy is a tall guy, very tall, and he was a middle distance racer. And the funny thing is that in that period, there was the two top champion that were always on, in television and on the newspaper were Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson. And yet this kind of name, Lewis Johnson, that was a kind, sometimes for the journalists was something crazy because they couldn't understand that there was a joke or was a man a bit behind, no? <laughs> because Lewis Johnson, it is really difficult to, to imagine that the top athlete of, of the, that era were Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson, and you were both. He was a middle distance after he became a very clever so-called rabbit or pacemaker. And after he, he jump in the our category of journalist. So uh, now I leave the, the floor to Tracy to discover Thank you. what is the real story about Lewis Johnson. Thank you very much, Gianni. Um, Lewis, can you give us an overview, a bit of a snapshot, if you like, of the gift of life story and how you became involved in it? Ah, sorry, sorry, sure. I, I, I forget. Sorry, I forgot to sh to show the trailer of your thing. Sorry, I, I am not so good sometimes in organizing things. Sorry, I, I, immediately I will show it. Three thousand meters. Going out well. It was a pretty quick pace. I remember Moy kind of slowing up, and he he went down, and he went down pretty hard. At that moment, I thought I was just going over to help somebody get up off the track. I, I could see pretty immediately that he was in a bad way, and you know, I, I heard some words. I was able to perform CPR. It's still scary. There's no uh, there's no real answer as to what's happening to him. So I thought it was a boy, Campbell. 
When Pat came to my rescue, he saw that someone was in need and he jumped right on it. I was thinking, what's the best gift you can give someone? And for me, it's life. There you go. Lewis, just give us a bit more detail on that story. Take us to the heart of it. Sure, Tracy. First of all, it's great to be with all of you today. Um, and uh, just uh, really great to see this community of journalists and to uh, have us all in one place. So thanks to AIPS for organizing just an important uh, journey to help these journalists continue their journey as we do this. And Tracy, great to see you and great to have a question from you. Um, that uh, moment was one of the scariest moments of my career in television, 25 years so far, as Johnny sort of alluded to after retiring from track and field. And so there we were in the New York Armory uh, covering the Milrose Games, one of the classic iconic track and field meets in the world, which used to be in the um, downtown at the, uh, at the garden. And now it's uh, uptown at a different location. And just another race that was happening, and Kamoy Campbell was the rabbit, which is Johnny referred to. That was something that I did back in my career. For those who don't know, in track and field athletics, this is known around the world, someone is typically paid to be in the front of the race to make sure that there's an even tempo, a fast pace going around early so that the other runners will follow. It's a very important job. Uh, and I did that many, many times for some of the great runners, and it was a great honor. Uh, and so Kamoy Campbell, the Jamaican middle distance runner, how about that? How often do you say Jamaican middle distance runner? You always say Jamaican <laughs> sprinter. He was uh, leading the way. And then suddenly after a couple of laps, he literally stepped off the track and collapsed as you saw in the video. Um, and it was very close to my position. It was also close to where the shot putters were throwing the indoor shot. Well, it was, it was shocking because of the way he fell and the fact that he did not move and it became nearly a panic situation as the race still continued. As fans were still cheering, suddenly this focus was on this human being and, and why he wasn't moving. So as you saw in that piece, um, a gentleman named Todd, who was, a, um, was there to work as a spotter, someone helping us on NBC, which was rescued, began to turn him over. And it just the medical situation escalated very fast. Um, everything suddenly stopped. And when you saw him, you, you can know, you know when someone's in trouble, you knew that he was in trouble. Well, to fast forward the story, it, it, it became, it went from being a, a, a moment or an event we were covering a sport to where suddenly we were covering, you might say, a news story. We were not sure if this young man was going to live because he had no, no motion, no life in him. And so the idea that someone immediately began to give him CPR was the beginning steps of saving his life. And that's why Kamoy called it the gift of life because uh, the gentleman came over to turn him over and began uh, the compressions. Um, later in the piece, let's uh, reveal from a doctor that um, a human being only has about two minutes of no blood flow in the brain before you begin to have brain damage. And the fact that CPR was given to him right away and they kept moving his blood through his body and through his brain through CPR uh, is why he was able to not only survive, but also have his brain function back. Um, I talked to Kamoy a couple of weeks ago, but he's doing fine. He has a new device in his under his heart, similar to a pacemaker. Um, he's had a couple of episodes because Kamoy's a little hard-headed. He likes, still likes to do some athletic things, but he survived and he's able to have a great spirit and have a, another life now as a coach and things like that. But in that moment, as a journalist, um, it's important to walk a very fine line. Um, I was ob obviously curious to know what was happening to him as a human being. And I also had a job to do as a journalist. There's the fine line right there, is to be able to observe what's happening, try to get a few details and a few notes to maybe make some sort of a report that's accurate without speculation. Without speculation, I think it looks like without speculation. And give an accurate report or update, but also give the space that allows the humanity of the moment to happen. In other words, let the medical people do their job, allow his then girlfriend to come and be with him and, and she was in a panic state without you know, going to ask her any questions that bother her. So I think it's important in everything we do as journalists is to remember our humanity, remember the humanity of the moment and those that you're covering and try to have that as part of what you're doing. And so that was a very, very scary moment um, uh, for sure with a great outcome. I'm so thankful that uh, we were able to do the piece 
uh, a year later for him to have the courage to come back to that venue and share the piece with the world. And of course, the, the entire uh, purpose of that was not only to show you that he was okay, but also to inspire everyone to take a CPR class and learn how to do it because you may be called on to give the gift of life. Lewis, it's so important when you talk about uh, the humanity of a story and the role of a journalist or a reporter or a broadcaster. And one of those most difficult things you explain there, you have to be conscious of everything around you, who might be watching, his family might be watching. You don't want to distress them more than is necessary without knowing uh, what the forecast is going to be for this man. How do you deal with all of that in the moment? How do you guarantee that you keep your own heart rate at a decent pace? It's like those biathletes, you know, that go skiing like maniacs through the snow and then have to calm their heart rate down to shoot at a point. How do you do that? And then afterwards, what, what is important about the process of looking back and analysing your performance in that? ready for the next time? Yeah, two great questions, Tracy. I would say, first of all, um, you need to understand what your role is in a moment like that, okay? Um, even, even in an interview, um, when I'm preparing or conducting an interview, the interview is not about me. It's not about how much I know. It's not about how much I can spit out and say before I let you begin to talk. I should try and say the least amount of words that will, will, that will then get you to begin to speak and re reply to what's going on. And in the same, in the same token in a situation like that, that moment is not about me. I am simply there as a conduit of accurate information or an update that will keep our viewers uh, uh, sort of in the know for what's happening. And if I don't have anything, don't make it up. Uh, I, I always believe that less is more. That's the way I was trained as an NBC reporter. Less is more. You know, I don't need to say a whole lot sometimes, uh, or sometimes I don't need to say anything. So in that moment, I go back to that same word humanity, which is I think a word that the world and truly in our country, we need to be focused more on is humanity. Look at the person across from you and see them as a fellow human being. It has nothing to do with politics or color or religion, anything like that. And then the reason I love the Olympics so much is that I believe it is the ultimate global stage where people come together and leave all those things outside and give their best performances uh, in the name of their country and for themselves. So um, it is important for me to just remain a human being, uh, be inquisitive to no enough that it's not overbearing or overarching into the story and get a few facts or a few details uh, that I can share with an audience that don't speculate about what we think the injury is or what we think is wrong with him. If we don't know, you say you don't know, but at least give some sort of me maybe mechanical update that they're doing this and they're moving this person from here to there. And then you go to try and get a follow-up. Um, I'm forgetting the second part of your question, Tracy, but... Um, afterwards, afterwards, because sometimes uh, the emotion of a moment can be quite overwhelming afterwards when, when you've gone away from it and you're sitting right. by yourself. Right. And so afterwards, um, the act, actual afterwards in that story was um, uh, about two weeks later. Uh, we actually had that, the Milrose Games in that event in that uh, location, and then we came back there two weeks later for the US, uh, USA Track and Field Indoor Championships. So I came in a bit early so I could go to the hospital and visit Kamal. <clears throat> he was literally across the street. And so I went to, he allowed me to come and visit and uh, we had time to talk in a little lounge. And he appreciated the fact that I would take a moment to do that. And for me, I appreciated the fact that he would receive me because it was a very traumatic situation. But that moment allowed me uh, with his uh, approval to then give her an update and a report on NBC two weeks later uh, as to what happened. So we can put a little bit of video that is not obtrusive to the moment and remind people who saw that or tell people who didn't see what had happened. And then I was able to give an on-camera update as to what he was doing. And we flashed a couple of pictures that we took while we were there. So sometimes the after is like within a few minutes or a few hours uh, in a long event. And in the Olympics or world championships, you can come back the next day and give an update on something. In that situation, it was two weeks later. They gave an update that gave people some peace of mind that this guy survived. He's going to be okay, we believe. Yeah. And so that's very important, which leads me to this, Tracy. In our business, I believe personally that relationships are everything. Relationships are everything. And I have always believed that you have to work hard to earn relationships with people. And you have to work hard to keep those relationships with people. All right. Which to me, for me, means that 
I believe in not just on the record conversations, but I also believe in off the record conversations. That's a personal choice. But I believe in having discussions with people where they feel like they can speak to me about things that they don't want communicated in the media. And I understand and respect that. And when they see that you will honor those moments of discussions and chit chat about things that they don't want to be public, and they check their phones and they don't see you blasting it out on all the social media platforms, then they figure maybe they can trust you. So it's over time. Johnny mentioned my career as an athlete. Many of the people that I've covered have been people that were my contemporaries in, 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 in track and field and athletics. I competed with some of them. And so I still now see them uh, either as athletes or agents or coaches or what have you. So those relationships span over time. Uh, it's important to, just, to figure out how you want to operate in this space. Are you an investigative journalist? Then you may probably don't have an off the record you know, card in your deck. Everything you hear or see is gonna be on the record. That's not me. So relationships are everything, building trust, earning that trust, keeping that trust. And at the Olympic stage, I can tell you for sure, I've having done 10, that those moments at the Olympic games, some are a winner, are the most impactful, the most emotional. And when it's gone great, and the moment has arrived as they wished, they come into the mix zone and they see me and whoever, and they are happy to come over and share the story, that's wonderful. But when it's been a disaster, when everything has fallen apart, and when they come into the mix and they see me, are they feel comfortable enough to come over and open up their heart and talk with honesty? That's relationships, so that's very important. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful message um, of trust and how you go about engendering that uh, with the people that you work with. Before I head back to Gianni, I want to ask you this. This is on the record. We've got people okay. from all over the world listening. Um, all right. We talk about the humanity of the Olympics, and I know uh, you love the Olympics as much as we all love the Olympics. We've got a really interesting situation happening at the moment, and um, Naomi Osaka, the tennis player who lives in the USA, she's representing Japan in Tokyo, and she said over the weekend that, you know, of course she wants to go to the Olympics. She wants Tokyo to happen. She's an athlete. That's what athletes want. But at the same time, there's this bigger story. And the story of sport is inside this bigger prism. How do we get that balance right? And what do you think should happen with Tokyo? So give me the story that you're talking about, because I'm thinking about a couple of stories that are in the bigger prism. Are you talking about her and the situation here in America with race relations? Are you talking about the fact that coronavirus is you it's know, all of that. Like we, we talk about, yeah. you know, Tokyo is going to be an Olympic Games in a bubble. And yet the reality is we all live in bubbles anyway. You've right. got the prism right. of the USA and that, that racial bubble that Naomi right. has been navigating so incredibly. Right. But you've got this other global bubble, which is the COVID bubble and how every country is handling that differently. Right. <clears throat> and, and, and amazingly here in America, those, those two things are coinciding uh, with each other. There's, there's no question about it. Um, I think that she has obviously a very, very unique uh, platform to use. And for athletes that I work with, I, give, I do media training, coaching for athletes from college to pros to Olympic athletes. And I speak to them about their platform, how you're going to use it and how important it is to have prepared your understanding of how the media works, your overall philosophical approach to talking with people, and then the mechanical side of it. How do you, how do, you do it in terms of your your content and, and your eye contact and, and, your, and the way you actually speak to people. And those are things that you should be prepared for. And I'm sure Naomi is prepared for ahead of time, but she's had these now, these two universes combined as being a, a black Japanese young lady, of course, in the Olympic games. Uh, you know, for me, I, I have all respect for wherever we go, but I do hope the Olympics happen. There's no question about it. And I'm sure she does too, because she has some things that she wants to demonstrate on the tennis court and then be able to message about that. And of course, all these different things we're going through. Um, it's a very tricky thing. Uh, when you're a really high profile, you need the, the right team of people around you to help you understand the temperature of where you're going and, and how we're going to approach it. Understand the cultural customs. She probably understands the cultural customs of, of Japan. And of course she does here in America. So you have to be able to speak to both of those worlds. Uh, and so I think it is, it is um, <clears throat> Excuse me. This is why the Olympics are so powerful. We've had so many powerful messengers, not just athletes, but messengers on the platform of the Olympic Games. I was talking to John Carlos a couple of nights ago, and he has he gave the world one of the most powerful messages ever on the Olympic platform. 
absolutely misunderstood back in 1968. And some still to this day want to challenge him on the message. But um, it was absolutely needed. <clears throat> and whether or not it should have been done or not, that's for somebody else to decide. So I think for Naomi, she needs to be aware of people like a John Carlos, others through, uh, through history who have used their performance to then <clears throat> advance or forward an important ideal or an important message. Uh, and I think that's the real power of the Olympic Games. Um, that is one of the things that I love to be a part of as a conduit or a messenger or as a reporter. Um, you know, I'm listening to our an, a, analysts and play-by-play -play people up in the booth do their thing, and uh, my job is to listen. And then when the athletes come to my positions to put a period or, or answer those questions at the end about the race, the performance, or other bigger topics like that. So um, for all of you journalists who are listening, um, the question that Tracy asked me is so very important because you need to be aware of the subject you're covering, and it's beyond stats and numbers. The beauty of the Olympic Games is about, you know, what position they have in the world and what their voice may mean in terms of uh, for certain topics. And you need to be prepared for that. Uh, be prepared to be able to answer questions that match the moment. Tracy, I want to show you one quick thing. Um, when Bolt was about to, you saying Bolt, the great Jamaican sprinter was about to win his last Olympics. Um, I thought about the questions I would ask him um, after his last race, which would be the four by 100 meter relay. Uh, he would have completed what our then play-by-play -play man triple, 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 three times, 100, 200, four by one. I thought about the questions for months. I could be in the grocery store with my caddy, uh, getting some food here and there. And I'm thinking about what am I going to ask him? I have a minute and a half with a series of maybe three or four questions. And the question should match the, the intensity of the moment. And I say these questions because it was one of the most significant interviews that I think I've ever done in my career because of what he meant to the stage, to sports, and um, the, 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 the joy and excitement he gave us. So I say these, I have them up on my, uh, back here on my, in my credenza. And I thought, what would you ask a guy named Usain Bolt? And so the challenge to your reporters out there is, is, is to be ready to match, to have questions that match the moment. So for the last question, the last interview I asked him, I said, tonight, the finish line represents so much. You complete the triple triple, which is three times one, two, 100. Um, how did you live up to the declaration to win all three? Okay. So how did he live up to do that? The second question I asked him, I said, you arrive in the company of Pablo Nomi, the great finish runner, and Carl Lewis, who had nine Olympic goals. What does that mean? Um, before those games in Jamaica, he said, before the games, the Olympics need me to win. I said, why did you say that? And then the final question, and this is just us praying that he might decide to come back for one more Olympic Games. I said, American <laughs> swimmer Michael Phelps uh, came out from retirement for more gold. Is there any chance we'll see you in Tokyo for 2020? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I knew the answer before I asked him, it would be no, but I had to ask. <laughs> and then my last comment I said is that you leave an impossible void to fill. So when you ask me a question about a, a young athlete, a woman like Naomi, who was going to have a significant uh, performance and a significant opportunity to message to two countries and to two worlds, to Japan and to the United States. It is very important that as a journalist, you don't walk up to someone like that and say, how do you feel? Or was it a good night? You must do better than that. You must think and think about the position that they have and think about um, what they're out there to do beyond sport and be able to ask questions that match the moment. And hopefully the athlete will deliver answers that match those questions. Uh, that's our charge as a reporter in, in sports, and I'm sure that will, will work for, for really anything we cover. Well, Lewis, I just hope that the Tokyo Olympics happens so that we can hear your interviews from the mix zone. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate been that, Tracy. Wonderful having all of those lessons. Thank you so much. Back to Gianni. So now I can tell you that Lewis has uh, touched one point that is very important. I want to show you the photo. He was speaking about this gesture of Tommy Smith and John Carlos during the Olympic in 68. We will talk perhaps about this uh, matter very soon because uh, this kind of uh, gesture will be not allowed now from the AOC at the Olympics. So it is something that we can discuss about in the future. But now it's time also to go to speak about Tracy, no? Tracy, first of all, 
now you have to to introduce yourself how you became a journalist a very brilliant journalist what we have done before what was uh, what has inspired you uh, just very briefly, um, my mother and father were professional surfboard riders. So uh, it was when professional surfing just started. It was at the end of the 60s, the early 70s, and they were chasing waves around the world. And one of the first places they went to, and I was three years old, I travelled with them, was South Africa. And we ended up living in South Africa, but it was at the time, and, and we heard Louis talking about the, the Stop the Tour, the rugby tour, and um, the apartheid regime in South Africa. And we were there then, and we were introduced to, to this other world and what was happening and, and how the rest of the world was influencing this place. So I've always been really fascinated in stories and cultures and people. Uh, when I finished school, I actually studied public relations first and I was working doing um, publicity for sporting events, but I wanted something more meaningful than that. And I was very lucky when uh, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, phoned me up after a very busy year when I'd been working for two and a half thousand events in Australia in 1988. And they said, we're doing a traineeship in broadcasting and um, we always have so many men that apply. Uh, we would like some females to apply. We don't know any, but we know that you like telling stories and we thought you might like to consider this. Um, so, of course, I applied and I was most grateful that I got it uh, because it sent me off on this path of um, broadcasting and journalism and that interaction of sport and what makes the world go round from politics to business to humanity. Um, these are the great stories of the time. And it's wonderful to be able to tell those stories through sport. Okay, now we, we send the video and after we begin to talk again. Wait a moment only because I have to find always the solution because there is always something behind. I went on, on the wrong side. Wait a moment that I prepare <laughs> because you know I'm not so used to this kind of stuff and uh, I'm not so. Wait a moment. I'm not a technician, unfortunately. I'm a disaster. But anyway, here is the. We may be living in a supremely visual society, but radio is still one of the fastest and most emotional mediums out there. One of the unique aspects of radio is the scope and immediacy of its coverage. Here at PMGM 2018, despite having only two commentary positions, Czech Radio is able to broadcast from virtually all venues, thanks to today's mobile technology. We have uh, here for the first time broadcast on this complex of internet and DAB radio. We are 24 hours on air. If you see the story, you can get things voices immediately to the radio, you can be broadcast radio. Many years ago, you need half an hour, hour to get your story to the card now, it's so it's, it's, it's so incredible. You just sort of switch your phone on, dial it, and it's on the air. But before before it was in this way. How do you make a picture? Using only words. How do you convey the magic of sport? With no moving images. How do you put people on the edge of their seats when there's nothing to look at? Radio has always had a powerful voice in bringing iconic moments from the Olympic Games to the world, elevating the imagination of the listener. Millions and millions of people, that's their main communication with the Olympic Games, and it reaches everywhere in, in the outskirts of Australia to northern Siberia to any part of the world you want to go, radio will be there. We will create some more information 
emotional amount. You can, you can pay attention, you can uh, follow it all by yourself without being too much distracted from the environment. A great sports radio show. Can just bring sports to life in a way that very little else can. Okay. Okay. So uh, at the, you know there was a mistake because I I, I begin the the video from the middle because I forgot to go to, to the start. So I went back to the beginning to show also some picture of how it was the radio many years ago. It was not so sophisticated as now. You are now a lucky girl because you, you can uh, make uh, your work everywhere also with the radio. Before it was not so easy at all. So now how you can, in a radio program, you can show to the, to the public the feeling because in the video, Louis and Louis Johnson, they can show the face, they can show the tears and so on. But in the radio, how is possible? Um, I think sometimes in many ways um, it's easier because uh, there, there is only one medium and it's the voice. Uh, and, and you become um, caught in the emotion of everything that is happening around you. And so you reflect that. And so many times uh, I, I love radio more than television for that because it's very intimate and the person that is listening to the story that you're telling, and it might be a lot of energy or it might be very quiet or it might be very solemn or tragic, but the story that you tell and the emotion that is in the words you use and the descriptions that you use to, to paint that picture for them, um, it's, it's a personal relationship. And the person on the other side that is listening to these words is imagining the story as you're describing it. And I'm, I'm so thankful for this because when we were in South Africa at that time, so it was 1968, as I say, we went there, 1969, and it was when man first went to the moon. And in South Africa, they didn't have television then. Everywhere else in the world had television, but television was banned in South Africa at that time. So while people remember those incredible images of man landing on the moon and the incredible statement that was made about one small step um, for mankind, I heard that on the radio. That was the only way we could hear it in South Africa. And it just um, it set my imagination alight. And so radio has always been a love of mine. And I think radio broadcasters often make very good television broadcasters as well because they understand the power of the voice without having any pictures to rely on. Um, and second to that is that today we're seeing a, a huge uptake in podcasting, which is basically a new form of radio. It's listening to people having conversations or describing moments or interrogating issues or any of those things. And we're so lucky in the world today that we have things like um, iPhones, you know, smartphones, we can film ourselves, we can record ourselves, we can film other people. All you need is a telephone and you can be a reporter making programs anywhere in the world. Yeah, and let's uh, give us an example. If you would be live in this moment, how you would uh, tell to the to people that listen this moment with the, the word in front of you, with this kind of uh, uh, organized uh, school and so on? Tell, try, try to <laughs> connect and tell, no, because this is the moment, no? It, this is the moment. And I think this is, I was saying to Gianni before we even started, before everybody joined on, this is this is like history. And and this is this is telling us also how the Tokyo Olympic Games is going to happen. It will be a very different Olympics because we're living in a very different world. Before the COVID pandemic, and here is the great irony: this COVID pandemic has has infiltrated. Every country, every person has been touched by this, whether it's because um, they've suffered it or somebody in their family has suffered it or, or a business in their street has suffered or people have lost their jobs. 
we understand that impact and it's it's divided worlds, it's shut borders, it's impacted everybody. And yet here is the whole world. It's evening, my time. This evening, I am looking at faces from the whole world. And, and this is a world that has been shut down in so many ways. And I think this is a story about human triumph. This is about what people can do when and hurdles are put in front of you. Humanity can find a way through. And this is an extraordinary example of that. And, and I think what you're doing, Gianni, and all of the mentors and, and all of the reporters that are here, what is happening here, this is what we're going to see in Tokyo as well. This will be uh, an Olympic Games like no other and here we are, we're sharing our stories now in the way that the Olympics will be sharing their stories in a few months' time. Okay, now I think that it's time to give the floor to the people that ask questions, what do you think? And we have already a, a, a lady over there, Lonnie, that she wants to ask something. To okay. You. To, to whom? Do we have three different person? Yeah. Who you choose? Okay. Ok, eh, ¿me escucha? Sí. sí. Eh, bueno, son dos preguntas en específico. Cualquiera de los tres puede contestarlas porque se relacionan a uno o a otro tema. ¿Qué, mm, perdón. ¿Qué pasa con, en esta edición de las Olimpiadas? Vamos a tratar, los periodistas tenemos un rol muy importante. ¿Cómo vamos a difundir temas tan controversiales? Como por ejemplo, la inclusión del transgénero femenino en la categoría femenina es un tema que va a ser bastante controversial, que ya está dando mucho de qué hablar, sobre todo porque Laura Hudbar, la pesista de Nueva Zelanda, sería la primera en participar, eh, transgénero mujer, en participar en las Olimpiadas. Eh, la segunda pregunta, y, y cito al señor Lu, eh, Louis Johnson, dice, las relaciones son todo y siempre debemos fomentarla y mantenerlas. ¿Pero qué pasa cuando esas relaciones fomentadas con los atletas, con los directivos de federaciones, pueden afectar la crítica periodista, periodística, hablando específicamente en el rendimiento del atleta o en el desarrollo de su labor como dirigente? Tenemos historias como el escándalo de la FIFA o como, periodista, como atletas como a Oscar Pistorius de, de Sudáfrica, eh, acusado de asesinar a su, a su novia. Eh, el mismo Maradona o en su momento la controversial acusación de violación a Kobe Bryant, ¿cómo podemos como periodistas tratar de dar una historia justa cuando se trata de este tipo de personajes? I think that for, for the, the problem regarding the transgender at the Olympics, I think that we will uh, have the next lesson on next Tuesday that we, we will speak about transgender and gender and uh, it's possible that we will have as uh, one of the guests uh, Martina Navratilova to speak about this uh, very difficult uh, subject because we have to respect all the human rights but in the same time we have to respect also some other balance so for, for this I think that we will we will talk about for two hours next week if you are allowed me but now I, I give uh, the, the floor to, you have asked to Louis no, Johnson. Um, solo quería saber el, la responsa, dentro, no del aspecto científico y entrando al debate si pueden o no I pueden, sino desde el área periodística, la responsabilidad que tendríamos los periodistas al abordar este tema y cómo abordarlo de manera que no daña la humanidad del atleta en sí, de la otra parte también. Can I say something, Gianni? Yes, you can. Okay, I, I, I think um, I've done several programs on uh, transgender sport and transgender athletes. And I think as a journalist, um, again, we can learn from the past. And I know that Louis and Lewis both said this, and it's very important because history does repeat itself. It comes along dressed up as a different issue but it's the same issue, okay? So this is about humanity and this is about real people and it's about real people's lives. And it's a situation where some people say they should not be allowed to compete in sport 
Other people, like the former CEO of the Commonwealth Games Association, David Brevenberg, who is now working for the human rights um, in sport in uh, Switzerland, he says sport is for everybody. Uh, who is anybody to decide that you can't participate in sport because of whatever personal belief I might have? And so I think as a journalist, it's very important when we're telling these stories we don't just have every other point of view, but actually we have the point of view of the people who are in this situation, the people who are being um, discriminated against or the people who love sport and cannot compete in sport. It's very important that we hear from their side as well. And as our journalist, as a journalist, our job is to reflect the world around us, but also to help people understand what can sometimes be a difficult or complicated or complex world that we don't all have experienced in. And so it's important we speak to the people who are implicated. You know, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, when they, they had the Black Power salute, that is because there was a message to a lot of people who had no idea what sort of lives they had to live, what sort of discrimination they had to face on a daily basis. And, and so many Americans still do, and that's now 50 years later. And so we need to look on what we learned from that and apply it to this latest challenge that we're facing, which is about real people, real human beings who are not the same as you or me, but we need to hear their stories as well. So now, Lewis Johnson, <coughs> you were asked <coughs> the second question. Luis, are you there? Yes, yes yeah. I'm here. Uh, okay. Let me just respond just a little bit to what Tracy said. Spot yeah, on, sure. Spot on answer, Tracy. Spot on. That's exactly right. Because we we must remember that we're talking about human beings. We're talking about humanity. Um, we had a situation in track and field uh, from an athlete, uh, Castor Semenya, who has been in question uh, as she's competed uh, for many years. And I can tell you as a human being, uh, the story broke my heart because imagine uh, the challenges we've all dealt with growing up as kids uh, with bullying and things of that nature, which make you feel uncomfortable, sad, unhappy, it does a lot of different things to people. But imagine to have your sexual identity uh, questioned, not just in the middle school hallways, or, but on the global stage, um, I cannot imagine. The strength of this athlete always amazed me, uh, Semenya. I think it's important though, uh, when I'm in my role at work, it's not for me to be emotional about it, it's for me to be factual about it, okay? And so for those of you who are writing stories who may be in a longer form situation where you're writing um, about it, it's important for you to be factual and make sure that you have your facts correct. We, um, as journalists or you covering the uh, story, do not make the rules as to why an athlete can or cannot compete. We don't make those rules. You are there to report on the situation. So being factual is extremely important in anything you do, but imagine a very sensitive situation like this. And then I think the other part, again, I'm gonna keep sewing the same word, is making sure that you remember your, your humanity. Don't become so, um, uh, so much of an, a reporter that you forget about being a human being. And it's important, again, with those relationships. Castro Semenya, an athlete who would stop and speak to me, I would speak to her about the situation and I would, very respectfully or gently ask a question like, how are you managing the situation you're in? Things of that nature. An open-ended question to allow her to go where she wants with an answer, not hitting her in the face with some sort of uh, just rough and difficult question. Those kinds of situations are important because as you begin to, be, uh, begin to build a relationship, maybe you can um, bring more light to how they are doing or how their community of, is doing of people, as Tracy mentioned, who are living lives that we have no idea about. So be a thinker, be a self thinker. Don't read what everybody else is doing or watch it and do the same thing. Find a different or unique way to bring some different perspective to the story so that people may not know. And oftentimes it comes right back down to that same word, relationships, trust. And that happens over time and figure out a way to share the story. But most importantly with these things, be factual. If you're not sure, don't give a second or third source. I never on the air say, 
sources say, or I heard, or it was, I, no, I spoke to so-and-so and he or she told me this. It's very important to be factual. I think that's really critical. Okay. Now there was another question. Uh, now the lady is, I don't see her. Hello? Okay. It was a very long question. I didn't get all of it. Uh. Yes. Okay, we, it, it was about uh, because we have another one, the same, the same question we had from Clarice from Cameroon. It's uh, you have spoken about the importance of making and keeping relationship in journalism. Does that affect your credibility as a journalist? And how are you making it work when it comes to speak with people who later are um, involved in crimes or robberies and, uh, and all other stuff? So how can you combine the relationship with the, with the people that you are getting in touch with, becoming friends maybe, and, and uh, when it's the moment to criticize them or, or something really serious come to them? That's a great question. Uh, and I've been in a few situations like that in my career where people have gotten in trouble for uh, anything from a doping charge um, to what we saw happen with Oscar Pistorius uh, in South Africa. Uh, those are very difficult situations. Again, I think it's just the, the matter of being factual. Um, if something happened, state the facts. If you can get a comment or a quote from them or from their, you know, their, someone in their group, that, that you, you try and do that. But again, um, I, I, my concern for a lot of the young reporters coming up today is that um, everybody wants to be first with a new piece of breaking news. And um, I'm, I'm not sure about Tracy, but I, I don't come from that camp anymore. I don't, I'm not trying to break any news and be first. What I want to be is right. I want to be correct and I want to be able to bring some context from something that's close to the situation if I can. So yes, there are times of people that I've known, you know, you, you, you see each other, you're happy to see each other and you have a nice relationship. And if something happens, um, I have to do my job. I'm, Tracy, I'm not sure about you, but I can tell you for sure for us, it's one of the mandates that we have at NBC. that when I put on the headset or when I pick up the microphone to step into the, uh, my position, I don't have a country. I'm not sure if you know what that means, but I don't have a country when I step in there. Yes, I have a US passport. Yes, my wife is French. All these kind of things are cool, but when I step in to do my job, I don't have a country. So I don't say we or us or our American team, it's the team, it's Team USA. It's Ameri the American team. Or when I'm talking to you, I'm not gushing because I'm so excited you did this, or I'm crying because things didn't go well. I don't have a country, I'm an objective journalist. And so sometimes it calls for us to, I mean, calls for us to be objective journalists in the role when we're working um, and then again in your relationships away from work you have to make sure that you know where the line is between being a journalist and being a friend or being someone you know and I think most of the times the people on the other side they they know that line as well but it can be it can be challenging again you have to do your job when it comes, when it comes time to do your job yeah, I think Lewis is um, absolutely right. It's not, you're not part of the story. It's something he said right back in the beginning. And uh, when you're reporting, you are not, I am not part of Team Australia. You know, I'm there because the world is competing and, and you're sort of, you're, you're an observer. You're supposed to be a neutral observer. And of course, sometimes things are emotional. Um, it, it's very easy to, to understand what the people in the story are going through and your job is to try and detail um, that emotion and, and um, you know, the, the complexities of it. But remember that you are outside of that. Uh, you are neutral. I was very lucky. I had the opportunity to live and work inside China. And so I worked for a number of years for China Central Television. And um, one of the beauties of covering numerous Olympic Games for that network was that we were doing it for a world audience. And so that there was no way of getting involved with one team or the other uh, because we were reporting on all of the highlights for, for everybody in the world. And, and that was also a really great um, learning experience for me. Uh, when it comes to relationships, um, sometimes relationships will end, you know, because sometimes people that you have built a relationship with and that you um, have come to trust and report on and follow, they will do the wrong thing. 
uh, and they will be caught out. And sometimes it, it falls on you to tell that story as well. Uh, and again, it comes back to, you know, those sort of professional standards that we're all supposed to be guided by, those ethical standards. And yes, unfortunately, sometimes it means friendships are over. But I come back to something else Lewis said and when he was talking about Casta Semenya. And um, it's, it's, it's that ability to foster that relationship and um, to, to want to be accurate and to want to be right and to get the right information from the right people instead of rushing to be first. But what will end up happening is that because people trust you, it, it ironically means they will come to you first. And so you shouldn't fight to be the first to tell a story because if you fight and you strive and you have a professional career to tell an accurate story and to be fair to the people that you're reporting on, they will end up coming to you first next time. Yes, and there is also the problem, for example, it was uh, touched the problem of uh, Pistorius, Oscar Pistorius. I've had the occasion to write with him the book of his life. Before, before the murder, sure. And when uh, he, he has killed his uh, fiance, I was very, very objective in uh, describing what I thought about him after, after this murder is normal. One day maybe that I will meet him again, discussing as a man that has lost a big occasion because he was doing very good thing and he has, uh, uh, destroyed the possibility to help uh, many people as he was doing before, only for a night in which he became uh, crazy or he went out of mind. He will never perhaps tell what happened exactly that night, but uh, in, in the, even if he were a friend, what I've written about that night, it was very clear. I think that uh, our relationship with some champion are changing at the moment in which they fail, or sometimes we fail also to understand that they were on the wrong side of the story. But the most important that after we, we have the balance to judge them in the proper way. We have to judge not as a friend, but as a professional. Sometimes it's not so easy, but we have not to be afraid to lose a friendship because our profession is more important. Now let's go to another Alarbi from Yemen. Alarbi is there, is not there. We go to Erenayo from Nigeria. Alarbi after. Erenayo is there or not? She was there. Alarbi, now you can make the question. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Mr. Jani. Hello. Hello, Aswali, the Raya, the Mudhila, the Kudwa, the Tracy. So, Ali, what is the problem that you have to do with Tracy? And the problem that you have to do with Tracy? In the beginning, the Amalha, and the Mishwarha, the Mihani, and the Alami, the Tadim, and the Idai. بماذا تنصح الشباب المقبلين في هذا المجال أو الشباب المبتدئين الذين يعملون في تقديم البرامج الإذاعية شكرا هذا هو سؤال Can you just repeat the, the very start of it? What is it about the start of your career? What, what did you want? Okay, okay سؤال اوكي سؤالي ما هي الاخطاء التي وقعت بها والعقبات التي اصطدمت بها في بدايه مشوارك في المجال الاعلامي في تقديم البرامج الاذاعيه بماذا تنصحين الشباب المقبلين في هذا المجال او الشباب المبتدئين الذين يعملون في تقديم البرامج الاذاعيه والذين هم ليسوا محترفين والذين لا نطلق عنهم محترفين ماذا تنصحيهم؟ شكرا Look, my advice is, and I think uh, I'm pretty sure that Louis and Lewis would say the same thing. It's it's so important to um, because we are professional observers, really. Uh, before we before we uh, talk, before we write reports, before we broadcast, before 
any word comes out of our mouth, we are professional observers. And so the most important thing is to, to read as much as you can, to watch other people, to look at good people, professional people doing their jobs and seeing how they do it. Uh, also seeing sometimes how they might stumble and learn from other people's mistakes. It's really important. And I think observing and listening are two of the biggest keys um, to success in this industry. Uh, when it came to hurdles in my career, when I first started, it was quite interesting because when I began, I was taken into um, the whole sports department was all men. And so I was the first woman that was taken in there and, and they, they showed me to a seat and, and then just went off and did what they did. Um, and so I kind of had to, again, watch, learn, observe. And then I thought, okay, now I have to step up. Now I have to provide something. So if this is about filing reports, I'm going to go and file a report. Uh, and I, I did it as best I could. I gave it to several people and said, can you please listen to this and give me advice? Um, and, and that was how the ball started. You know, sometimes uh, there'll be people pushing you. Other times you have to push yourself and uh, you have to find your way through. But um, it is the best profession without any doubt. And so any young one coming through, I totally encourage and, and say, look, look outwards, you know, look at what other people have done and learn from them. And then within that, find what is so, um, what is burning inside your heart? What are the stories you want to tell and how do you want to tell them? And discover what is your own voice and let your own voice flourish. Okay, now we go give to, to Kai. Now we go to Kai from USA and Germany. Right. Hello. Um, so I'm Kai. I was born in the US and currently live in Germany. Um, I was really interested in uh, what Mr. Johnson had to say about um, bringing the gift of life. Now, the thing is, I actually have three kidney transplants and I compete in the World Transplant Games. And I would love to make that a you know, bigger story. And I've, I've, I've covered it for like, you know, small things, but I really want that to really, you know, be more well known. What do you, what do you think that we can do to make that a reality? Wow. You've had Kai, first of all, it's great to hear from you. And I'm glad to meet you out here in this, uh, in this zoom. You've had three kidney transplants. Yes, sir. I have four kidneys from four different people in my, in my body right now. One of my own, one wow. from my dad, one from my mom, and one from a substitute teacher. Unbelievable story. That's an unbelievable story right there. Um, and just, just thinking about the, the gift of life that you were given by family members and a substitute teacher to help you, that's, that's incredible. Um, Kai, I've never heard of the World Transplant Games. But I am extremely interested in that because, again, it is another segment of sport and life and humanity that people need to know about. So um, I will find a way to send an email to you um, because there are some athletes who I'm sure who are competing. Uh, I'm thinking about, um, Johnny, you can help me. I'm thinking about the 110 meter hurdler um, uh, American who had a kidney transplant. Um, uh, I can yeah. see his face. I, I can't call his name. Um, me either. Um, anyway, there was there was Chris Klug who won uh, bronze. Uh, the guy, the guy from the Arden, 110 Ardens. Yes, yes, yes. I, I can say Aries, Aries Merit, Aries Merit, yeah, Aries Merit. Ah. Merit, Merit. Right. Yes. So um, Kai, like you, Aries Merit needed a kidney transplant. He was competing where his kidney was running. Where kidneys were running at a very low um, percentage, but his sister gave him a kidney. And for any of you who may know the race, the hurdles where you run and you dive to get over the hurdles, his extra kidney is actually in his abdomen. And he is still able to compete. As a matter of fact, he's competing this weekend. I'm going to meet in, uh, in California. But it's an important story. And maybe he is an athlete that may want to get connected with you all's mission. I can't speak for him, but I think he'd be interested to know about it. And uh, maybe we can find a way to get some coverage of that because the stories within the sport are going to be important for people who may have had a kidney transplant or about to have one, and they may not be athletic, but just they could be inspired. 
mm-hmm. that's what sports does for all of us, right? It inspires us. So mm-hmm. what's the important message that you would want to get out to people with all the journalists listening here from around the world who are hearing this maybe for the first time? Why would it be important for you, for people to know about the world uh, uh, transplant games? Um, honestly, it, it, it's... Oh, oh shoot, I, I just blanked. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it happens um, to all of us. <laughs> um, so th- the thing is, um, for us, it's like we, we ha- we we're given another chance to live. I mean, right now I'm on my second, third, fourth chance at life. And the thing is, you know, we're, we're still able to, you know, ha- have a decent life. We're still able to you know, go out and do what we really want, you know, it's, you know, we may not be able to do it in the same way. We may not, you know, we have, we have to take medication every single day for the rest of our lives. You know, we still have to get tested and see, you know, how our kidneys are doing, how our organs are doing, be it, you know, kidneys for myself. They're also heart transplant recipients, lung transplant recipients, and that's way harder than, you know, kidney transplant. So, and it's, and we, we don't really get the uh, opportunities to really talk about um, living with an organ transplant all the time, because if you just looked at me, you wouldn't think that anything was really wrong with me, mm-hmm. basically. I mean, okay. yeah. yeah like, but uh, Kai, I think that you, you will be, somebody of us will contact you, so we will write the story about this, okay? Thank you, Kai. I want Kai, Kai. I want you to know that I, what I said. I'm not joking. I'm I'm texting Aries Married right now because I want to know <laughs> if he knows about the World Transplant Game. So somebody, please get his email address, and Kai will try to make contact with you and see. So th- th- this is some more light on it. Okay. Thank Sounds you so good. much. Thank you. Thank All you, right, man. Now, now we we go to to Canada to Canada with Devani. You're always present, Barney. Hello. Yeah. I was just writing down about about Kai's story. Anyway, um, it's the my question uh, is a and maybe it's a silly one, but um, it's uh, I would like to get the opinion of both uh, Mr. Johnson and Ms. Holmes about a pet peeve of mine. I think there should be a quota for every reporter to uh, ask the question. How did you feel when? I think it should be possible only three times a year. And if you do it more, you should pay a fine. Uh, because I don't think there are uh, more occasions where this question is, is really relevant and there should be better questions. I just wanted to uh, hear your, your thoughts on it. But, uh, sorry. Can, can you repeat Wait, the silly question? I, 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 I heard the question. And so his question is, you know, we really shouldn't ask athletes all the time, how do you feel? And if anybody asks that question more than two or three times in a year, they should pay a fine. Maybe they can pay some sort of a, a, a gift to AIPS or something. I think that Vani is completely wrong. I'm sorry. Really? Because okay. you, you have to think that when somebody is there, on life uh, and so on, there is a public behind that perhaps has never seen this athlete or this champion before on live on television. And is the same thing that they, the public will ask to him. So they are not silly questions. They are questions that are normal and they are questions that are clever. So you yeah, but, cannot yeah, but Johnny, I, Johnny. I think that I will find you if you ask another question as this. <laughs> no, but Johnny, no, Johnny, what Tracy, I, I, what no, Tracy no, is saying. I am, I, no, no, sorry. I, I have no, uh, no mercy okay. for the stupid question. Okay, I'm going to tell you, in the television okay. world, that was one of the first things I learned is we don't ask the question, how do you feel? We don't use those words. Okay. We're actually trying to get the same information, but for some reason, those words are not words we use. So what you're saying is, to me, in my opinion, is correct. You need to be more creative and think more to ask. You're trying to find out how the athlete's feeling, but we don't say the words, how do you feel? We just don't do that. Okay. That is off limits, and you should pay a fine if you ask it once. That's my opinion. Okay. <laughs> but I Fair don't enough. agree with the, with the yellow or red card. Oh, I think he's saying that in fun. <laughs> no? It's the public that judge our work. It's not that we join, we judge the work of other colleagues. Sorry, I am very, very serious on this. 
So after we, we have to go to see from which area. Let's go to Paraguay. There is a guy that is named Galaxy. That was the point. He, I will never give him the floor if till when is Galaxy only, okay? Oh. Go ahead, uh, La Torre. I said, I didn't know, I said it was the person. Hector La Torre. Sí, buenos días. Mi consulta era para el señor Johnson. Y cuando él habla de enfoque a la humanidad, se refiere a la empatía que debemos tener con nuestros protagonistas, por un lado. Y por otro, cuando habla de objetividad, se podría hablar de imparcialidad, porque de repente cuando contamos una historia o estamos por, por contarla, hay una pizca de subjetividad al contarla. Esas son las dos consultas para el señor Johnson, por favor. Muchas gracias. Um, so being empathic in a story, I think that that is something that we would hopefully naturally be, but still remain factual. Uh, it's important to state the facts. I think it's, an, it's important to be in touch with how you feel about something, yes. But there must be a point where you constrain your feelings to state the facts of a story. Um, when you're sitting down to speak with somebody one-on-one -on -one in an interview, then I think you want to allow your empathy to come through as you ask questions, depending on the situation, so that you can make the person you're speaking with be comfortable, feel comfortable to respond to you. Okay, you're not a brick wall talking to a brick wall. Okay, you are a human being talking to a human being. You have to be a journalist covering a subject. And so you can use words and you can use a tone that will allow a person to feel comfortable to give you an authentic response, if that makes sense. So that to me is using being em em empathetic as you're doing that. And your second question was? About objectivity. So he was speaking at the, the, um, the line between subjectivity yeah. and objectivity. Well, you, you must remain objective. I think you must, that's, I think that's your job. That's your job to remain, is to remain objective um, and uh, again, be factual. Uh, Sometimes I'm sure all of us, we finish the story, you, you drop your head, you shake your head, or you may cheer or whatever it may be. But in the moment, I think we are responsible for being objective if you want to be taken seriously as a journalist. So I, I think that's a very great, great questions. And I hope that helped. Okay, now we go to Ghana with the, the colleague, wait, wait a moment, J Mang from Ghana, Victor. Are you there? No. The funny thing that people raise the hand and after they don't answer. Okay, Martin, you, you, you are one of our men. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm here, I'm here. Ajima is here. I think, I think we have the, the, previous, the previous one from uh, Ghana, Jani, uh, first to him. Okay, Victor, Victor. My, my question is uh, to um, Tracy and then um, Louis, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, my question is, is it good as a journalist to accept uh, a position in any uh, association or federation, let's say um, in athletics association, appointing you as a journalist, uh, as, appointing you as a journalist as their communication director, is it a good idea? And is it acceptable to uh, accept that position? Thank you. I didn't understand the question. Can you ask it again, please? Yeah, Thank to, you. To receive the position in any federation, so athletics or any sports federation, to be appointed as journalist inside a federation. So I assume as a, um, a press officer or something connected to sport, but being a journalist, is that correct to accept that position as a role job? In a, within a federation? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So Tracy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start speaking and you can nod and tell me what you think about this, but um, I, you, I think you must decide, you know, what your position is as a journalist. What is your role? What is your goal? What are you after? Because you, on the outside, covering a sport, you are also covering the federation that runs the sport, which means that sometimes you may have to ask challenging or difficult questions of people who run the sport, right? Um, if you decide to move inside, now you're on the other side of the story almost, and now your, your allegiance, it seems to me, would be with the federation. And now you're being asked questions from journalists outside. So I think you need to decide where you're going to be. I, I think it's possible that you could take your skills from a reporter outside covering a sport and move inside the sport. But, but there are some different allegiances there and different responsibilities there. So 
I think you need to decide where it is you'd like to be. Do I think there's something wrong with it? No, but you, I think you need to understand the roles and responsibilities of being on either side of that. Outside of it, covering the event, covering the story, which could be good, it could be bad, it could be difficult, it could be whatever. Being inside, now you may be defending what's going on inside or what have you, or as you provide people to the media. So I think they're both could be a little different and I don't know that there's anything wrong about it. You need to figure out what your allegiances are, what's important to you, how you want to use your skills. What do you think, Tracy? Yeah, I agree. I think it's very difficult in some countries, though, where, um, you know, often it's difficult to earn a full time salary just as a reporter or a journalist, especially if you're covering a sport that maybe is not, you know, widely followed. Um, and so sometimes you can get part time work working in the sport as well. But but all of those issues um, are, are spot on, Lewis, because you end up being in a conflict of interest because being inside the camp, you will hear something that maybe they don't want to get out in the media or they might want to spin it a certain way or they might want to control that story, but you know the finer details. And as a journalist, you know, your job is to tell that story. So here you are um, both telling it and protecting it. Um, that is, it's a conflict of interest. I understand sometimes it's very difficult uh, not to be um, in that position in some countries, uh, but I think if you can avoid it, um, it is most useful. There is there is nothing wrong with being inside doing the media work for a sport or a sporting organisation, no problem. But when it comes into conflict with the role of a journalist, it becomes very difficult. Okay, now let's go to Martin. <clears throat> Martin. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jenny. I think all for this excellent, excellent session. I, I just want uh, to ask uh, uh, something to Louis Miles, uh, because I think it's important that the, the, the people here understand when you start with a story and you have the idea, you have the main idea, you don't know how it is, is going to be developed. Uh, as, as you said, for example, uh, South Africa ended up winning, but you didn't know that. Uh, so uh, how do you, do you decide if it's going to be a documentary, a short video, and, and when do you change if you need to change? How, how that, does uh, this work for you, for example? Um, so if you're going in for, for a longer form project, I think you need to look in, in terms of um, where you're putting it. So you can make, some of these things would be great television that would last an hour or 42 minutes, uh, which is the standard um, schedules that you get for TV. Um, I mean, and perhaps Tracy can intervene from a radio point of view as well, because um, um, you, you, you know there'll be certain schedules hit for that. But for a longer sort of feature documentary, when you're making something that goes into cinemas and you know like the, the stuff I sort of do and some of the great sports films out there, you've got to think in terms of um, what's a kind of what's what's compelling about it to make it into perhaps a three act structure or a five act structure, which you'd normally get in terms of drama. Now, not every film has to, to fit that because documentaries can be all sorts of things. They can be obstock, they can be, um, um, a, 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 again, fitting into a, to, to, to a narrative structure. But it does really help with keeping an audience for that length because you're asking someone to give up a lot of their time. If you watch one of these films, you're looking at 90 minutes, maybe even two hours sometimes. And that's a lot to commit to in a, in a very busy world. I've got young kids. I really struggle to watch stuff. I have to make time uh, in a month where I sit and watch latest films uh, to keep across things. And so, it, and what does that mean? It means a beginning and a, a middle and an end. We've, we've had some fantastic advice from, from, from Lewis and Tracy about um, relationships and they're all really, really valid in what I do as well, because um, you're asking someone to really go into depth and perhaps answer questions about themselves um, or about subjects they've never had to really look at before. You, you end up being sort of a psychologist in a way because you, you're not asking immediate questions, you're asking questions about why someone did something, why something happened, and was that related to something that happened before or in, in, in a grander scale. And, and some people may not have even thought about things in those terms before. So it's really, really hard. But I mean, I mean essentially to, to, to grab something for that long, I think I, I always look for, as I said before, context and about whether there's uh, an emotional um, human story um, and are the characters strong enough to pull you in? Is there, are you going to go with these people over this period of time? Or if, not, if there's not that, that human story, you know, are there enough 
sensational moments to 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 make it well. I made a film in Brazil about a guy who had a a 26 year professional football career but never played a game, and he was a con man, and he um, um, he he signed contracts with loads of famous clubs in Brazil and, and Argentina and the uh, likes of Flamengo and Palmeiras and huge, huge clubs and became a national celebrity, he had his own TV shows and all the rest of it. And it was all based on the lie that he was a footballer. And when we started that story, it was just an incredible story. We didn't know where it was going to turn up. But then when we went there, we had to go and build trust with all the contributors, himself, the players that he, that he was involved with. And we're talking some major names in world football getting involved in this. Um, and get the and get their trust to to to, to get it across. And we, we did seventy two interviews, and you, you've got to you've got to then how many do you, those do you put in to make it engaging? And 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 so um, in that case, the story was good, the character was good. I mean, because he's a con man, so you know he's gonna he's gonna um, come across with some stories. He's gonna be probably lying to you. He's gonna get people to lie for him, you know, to you, and then other people are gonna tell the truth, and then you could. Then you've got real, a real story to un, uh, to to unravel. Um, but yeah, that's a, the kind of long and um, sort of. There's different ways, but you know, essentially, what's going to grab your attention for that long? Okay, now we go to Maritza Cardenas. Okay, thank you for this session. Has been wonderful for all our guests, and I have a question for Luis. Uh, a little bit of context, uh, last year in the cycling race in Lombardia, a rider, uh, Remco Evenepoel, he lost control of his bike and he fell off uh, a bridge. And while many broadcasters decided to don't show those images anymore, uh, there were some that just keep repeating them over and over again, even before anybody knew what happened to him, because of course he could have died because he was a big fall. And then I had a quick exchange with some of the broadcasters that decided to do that on Twitter. And then he said pretty much, uh, yeah, it is our job to inform. And part of informing is just showing these kind of things. And I said to him, yes, but this is also a person, a 20 year old athlete that you're showing the images of him almost dying and his family is possibly watching the television too. And then he said, yeah, but that is part of our job. And I said to myself, yeah, but where do you find the line between informing and keeping the humanity and knowing that there is people on the other side that also deserve some kind of intimacy and privacy in moments that are this difficult? Luis, if, if it doesn't tell you, is I have seen this, uh, this uh, situation, I have followed this situation. But it happens also. Sometimes it happens also in um, in the motorbike, uh, in uh, Formula One, uh, in skiing, uh, everywhere. No, and this uh, you, you can leave only to the sensitivity of the director to choose the, the way in which to tell this uh, real story. It uh, it happens it happens to him. Yes, in this case uh, you you have, you have to look. Uh, to put your hand on your heart and to be on the part of the parents of other people, because uh, unfortunately, the, the tragedy of somebody is not a, a show. We cannot uh, think that this is, is the real show, but it's something that uh, is in the privacy, it goes to, uh, to destroy the privacy of somebody. But you know, uh, now, unfortunately, also before, the tragedy for many people are also a show. Fortunately, this, uh, this cyclist uh, was, uh, was alive after. If not, uh, was going live, uh, the possibility that somebody could die live in television. The, the only part very special that came out, it was that uh, with this live emission, They've seen that one of the, the guy of his team, one of the men of his team, has taken away something for one of his uh, pocket. And somebody has thought that this was uh, something related to doping, no? There was also the, this other part of the reality. So I, I guess that uh, it, ups, it ups to the 
to the director in, in that time to, to decide what to do. Usually now, all the directors are avoiding to show all the drama till when they don't know if the, the, the man or the woman is alive. But some can also decide not to do it. Because this happened also in the any kind of news in television when there, there is a killing, life, and so on. So I, I think that uh, really what we prefer is to defend the privacy in that uh, difficult moment. But after, uh, you cannot compare them to follow some lines because uh, it depends by the sensitivity of person. Yeah. We are not in favor of this, for sure. Johnny, may I, may I add to that what you said? Yes. Um, um, I, I, I agree with you. And Martisa, thank you for a very, very, very important question. Uh, Johnny, I'm not sure if you were in the, uh, the uh, Winter Olympics in, um, in Vancouver, but uh, I, was I was there. Working, I, I, I was uh, there. Okay, this is the moment I will never forget, Martitza. Um, the Winter Olympics, we were having a training for the luge, and we had an athlete who came down the track and lost control of his sled on the last turn and was thrown out of the sled, and his body hit a metal steel girder and he flipped to the ground, and it was, it was the most horrific thing I've ever seen. This was in training. It happened on live TV. It happened so fast, you weren't quite sure what happened. Uh, but the track was closed. There was immediate medical attention. And um, you knew right away there would be a miracle if this kid were to survive. And um, we had to um, stop everything. And um, ultimately, we got the word that um, the, the young man did, did die. his name. Uh, I, sometimes I don't remember names. But his name was Nodar Kumar Tashvili. And he was from the Republic. Georgia. He was, I think, 20 years old, 19, something like that. There must be a philosophical approach to how you handle a devastating moment like that. And what we did is myself and the producer and a few other people went to the TV truck, went back into a tape room, and someone on the on what we call an Elvis, a machine to replace things, pushed play, and that person left the room because he couldn't manage to watch. We watched it one more time and it was immediate from the producer on down. We could never show that again. We could never show that again because of something that Johnny mentioned so important. First of all, the privacy. We weren't sure at that moment if he was alive or not. And, and think about this. That young man was by himself on the other side of the world competing for his country. And can you imagine his family finding out or seeing the replay of him being thrown out and this devastating accident? There must be the strongest elements of humanity. There must be the strongest elements of respectful, responsible journalism in a moment like that. And, and for me, I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna tell you how I really feel. For me, if I'm working for somebody who thinks it's important to be shown that over and over again, I cannot work for you again because you have lost your sense of humanity. If that was your child or if that was someone you knew, would you want this to be shown over and over again? So it's very important, again, going back to what is your philosophical approach to what you do and how do you treat people, human beings that you're covering? And you need to remember that first and don't uh, exploit the terrible moments of somebody for your own good or for your network's good. And if somebody needs to do that, I can't work for you because you have lost your idea and your way for humanity. And so that kid died and uh, it was the most horrendous thing I've ever seen. Leaving. Uh, are finishing our day and I went back behind the TV truck and I called my wife and I broke down in tears and I called and I said, please hug our sons today for me because this young man lost his life and his family's not here to be with him or take care of him. It was horrendous. So those moments are very delicate. If it happens, live, it happens, but then what we do with it beyond that calls for responsible journalists and, and empathetic thinking in those moments. That's my opinion. Okay, now we go to India. Azarika. Yeah, you have to open the microphone, Azarika. Open the microphone. Okay. Open the microphone. Okay. okay. Good evening to all of you. Good evening uh, to Mr. Marlo. Hello, Tracy. And hello, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, EIPS, for this wonderful session. Uh, I think I, I really need to share something here with Tracy. I remember you teaching in 2017 how a smartphone 
can be used to tell stories around the globe using social media. In fact, um, I've been using this uh, smartphone as a very powerful tool to tell stories. 2019, there was a big international national event taking place in India. My sports manager was not convinced about covering this event, but I took the challenge of using my smartphone and covering a lot of events. Uh, doing my opening P2Cs, my closing P2Cs, taking interviews of athletes and, you know, doing uh, sound bites in a big zone. And right after three to four days, my manager sanctioned and said that, you know, you need to go and cover this even officially. So thank you, Tracy Holmes. And thank you, Mr. Johnson, for this wonderful session. And I loved you when you said less is more. Thank you. It's so lovely to see you. Um, it's been some time and uh, we worked together also at the Commonwealth Games in 2018. Absolutely. Um, and and yes. you're so right. And I think, um, you know, the reason why I love being involved with younger journalists and, and teaching, um, mentoring young ones coming through is that uh, while I can talk about all of my experiences and hopefully impart some sort of knowledge in that respect, I actually learn just as much by speaking with all of the young people and um, and learning, you know, what is new and and not being afraid of changes, because I think that's one of the biggest things, you know, as you go on through life and, and you pass through many different eras, things around you change very quickly and you need to stay on top of some of those changes. And I think we're so lucky and this next generation coming through is so lucky with what is available with technology, um, which means just like you and uh, just like me, um, we can go anywhere in the world and, and broadcast. I know some of um, my friends from that trip that I made uh, to India, I know yes. that some of the TV networks there have have phoned me since whenever there's been a big sports story here in Australia. And um, and I cross into their television programs just with my iPhone. So, you know, it's it's fabulous. It's a new world. And if we can all adopt that and learn from each other, I mean, I'm very happy to age gracefully, uh, but I certainly want to keep in touch with all of the changes for all of these young people coming through. Um, and you're teaching me as much as I can ever hope to impart to you. Okay, now we go to Algeria. Bashir. Bashir, yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, Thank you for an uh, uh, interesting uh, session. My, my question is, uh, as a journalist, how, how, can we, how can we do with uh, a dictatorial uh, regime for example, uh, me, I was arrested without the reason. How can we work in this uh, environment? To work in this kind of environment is very difficult. But what happened exactly to you? Really, I don't know. I was just uh, walking in the street and the policeman uh, attracted me without reason. Uh, but uh, you were working as journalist there. What happened? Yes, yes. And this, uh, we are completely against this kind of situation. In, in every country, there is a different, uh, uh, I think, uh, behavior of the police and also of the politics, especially. In this moment, we are trying to, to get out from the jail. One of our colleagues in uh, Guinea, he was arrested because he has criticized in, in a live radio program, the president of the Republic. And now he's in jail for the, that are near two months that he's in jail. So I think that if something happened, all the community of journalists will defend people that are arrested without any reason. And also, especially when they're doing their job. Because unfortunately, now in, uh, all around the world, there are many countries that are trying to put uh, the journalists under their shoes because uh, they are afraid of our freedom. But we will continue to fight for our freedom. This for sure. And let us know when something happened, exactly how is the situation and uh, we will be ready to defend you, to defend your rights. Now we go to Poland, Wojciech. 
Microphone. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I I think I have a few uh, remarks. First of all, I think it's maybe a, a remark rather than the question that uh, I think that it would be a useful thing to make some uh, session about uh, how shall we, the young reporters, promote our job because we might do some uh, great things. We might, but we might do better. We might do worse. But the thing is that uh, as we want to be more and more professional, I mean, to earn a living from that, we should be somehow noticed by by the potential uh, people who can give us those money for, for our job. So I think that it would be some uh, some good thing. I know it was not on the schedule of this college, but maybe somewhere between the lines, we could also uh, we could also do such a marketing thing because I see that uh, also the Kai asks about it and, and Doaz Noreen. So I think that's that's quite an important topic for us. Uh, but uh, coming back to what is uh, on this wonderful session, as uh, most of us see, um, I think uh, about uh, the fact of uh, those life-threatening situations, which uh, which Lewis was doing the, his documentary about and about uh, showing them live. Of course, the case of uh, Nodar Kumari Tashvili was uh, simply the live incident, and it it had it 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 was simply broadcasted and couldn't do anything about it. But uh, the decision about not showing it uh, anymore is uh, is I think that how it should be seen. That I think it should be uh, such things should be recorded as you did with uh, with the uh, Jamaican rabbit uh, and uh, and later may be used if everything seems okay uh, after the situation is stabilized but uh, the decision to show not to show it live is how how it should be done yes i think i think because and, and some other things that might happen as to record it as to prove for an investigation what happened so i think that those situations should be Recorded, televised, but not shown live after it until it uh, appears that it, everything is okay and everything is stable. Uh, about also what Louis said uh, that uh, when he is reporting, he doesn't have a country. Uh, I think there are two things. Maybe other people from other countries would see it because here in Poland, I don't think it is like this way anywhere in any media. Of course, we are objective. We are. We have the criticism, we know how to commentate on different things, but we are the part of the, the team. Maybe it's the mentality of the nation, and I think it's every other nation, uh, but it's uh, about maybe being the native Amer uh, English speaker, that you have some feeling of being the international reporter, even if you're doing that for your uh, national TV or national media. So I think that's maybe something that, uh, well, we all... Uh, in some way, we are jealous about not being the is so widely, uh, once again, widely known. Yes, but also about being the, the national reporter in the national uh, language or the English language, which is already becoming international. Uh, and Wojciech, Wojciech, but instead to make question, you are making yes, my are, so my question is a statement. Sorry, sorry, so, sorry yes, yeah, my question is the good journalists actually... are making very short question for long answer because if you make statement tomorrow, we are still here. Eh? Okay, sorry. Yes, my question is but was about the human rights thing. In fact, we, we, what we saw about uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith about uh, the Tokyo. Uh, my question mostly to, to Tracy, in fact, how do you think uh, the things should be, those things should be banned or there shouldn't be banned? Because I think that we see that Mexico moment from years and years and it's never getting older. In fact, it's getting uh, still a lot, uh, even becoming the second life. Uh, but shall we see those things on a podium or shall we see other in other moments, but during the Olympics, as this is the place where the whole world is watching and can answer that. Yeah, I think um, the IOC uh, involved their own athletes commissions inside each of the national Olympic committees around the world to get some feedback on this. Uh, there has been some criticism about the way that the questions were written um, in order to, to get the information that they wanted to hear. Um, so they have said that they're sticking with this rule, um, that their belief is that uh, the podium should be sacrosanct and that if anybody uh, stages any kind of a protest, then it might be ruining the moment 
for other people in that protest. Um, as it happens, I asked the vice president of the IOC, who happens to be one of the Australian Olympic Committee members, and he's in charge of the coordination committee on behalf of the IOC for the Tokyo Games. His name is John Coates. And I asked him just this past weekend, um, you know, whether he could not see that sports events that are happening around the world in the past year, there have been protests and people taking a knee and highlighting Black Lives Matter on a global scale. And, um, you know, why, why should that be banned from an Olympic Games? And he said uh, the IOC has made provision for, uh, you know, protests or discussion on these sorts of issues to happen in mix zones or press conferences or elsewhere, but not on the ground. Uh, and I did ask him about the fact that, you know, sometimes these are not political statements, these are humanitarian statements. Mm -hmm. And um, whether the IOC felt like it was losing touch with the right side of history, because we have been talking about this since 1968. Uh, but he said, no, that there, there are ways and means and that that podium must be protected at all costs. This is the uh, political neutrality of the Olympic Games. And um, that's their message. And that's what they will stick with. But uh, I think that uh, the neutrality of the podium doesn't exist because everybody are, after are using their telly to show to the world how big they are. So it's another hypocrisy. And I think that is very clear because after, depends by the number of the medals, how the politics is going somewhere, no? So I think that uh, the choice of IOC is very questionable and is not correct uh, during this time because are you looking what is happening now in Jerusalem, what is happening around the world? How people can refrain from to discuss about what is going on, 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 in, on in the world system? Mm -hmm. I think that we have to think about this. Now we have only a few minutes. I will give uh, the word to a guy that, that was there since the beginning from Sierra Leone, Alexander. Wake up and, and, and speak now. Alexander, open your microphone. Are you getting me? Are you getting me, please? Uh, I, I think that your connection is very bad. Hey, awesome, awesome. No, no, no. Let me just clear it. Let me just clear it. Are you getting... No, no, it's impossible. There is another guy from Sierra Leone, a son. A sun is frozen. A yeah, sun I think I think you're getting me now. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Gianni. Um, the, the question I want to ask is first of all, let me just say thanks to um, to Luis and um, Tracy. I've learned a lot from um, the things they shared with us, and for me, I think it's very much um, educating. But the question that I want to ask is, um, what do you do to encourage? Um, Physical, physically challenged um, journalists who are in the field to actually get involved in terms of um, covering um, these international competitions or even um, you know, getting themselves to be more active in the world of sports journalism. I'm a physically challenged myself and I've been doing the job despite um, the challenges are enormous, but um, I try my best to ensure I get involved in the activities. But what do we do? as um, AIPS to actually encourage more physically challenged persons to get involved in sport journalism. What? I didn't quite get the question. What, how, do, what, how do you uh, get, how do you encourage what? Uh, the, 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 the people that has physical challenge, physical problems, how they, they can do. But what I can tell you, I think that uh, Lewis, <clears throat> I can answer instead of Lewis, in, in, in the past, we have, we have also given uh, some recognition to people that uh, were in trouble physically to help them to continue in their work. Because what we can do is uh, to discuss uh, every case and after to find the solution if it's possible. And uh, if, you, if you let us know how, how is exactly the situation after we can give you with the help of other colleagues we could give you our, our advice and if it's possible also to help you. 
Now we go again to Yemen. I, we never spoke, we, we have already spoken with Ali last time. We go to Kamal. Assalamu alaikum, can you hear me now? Okay, now it's okay. Uh, thank you so much for this session. Thank you so much for this session. في البداية تحدثت عن صحة الحقائق المتعلقة بالقصة عند كتابتها أنا كصحفي كيف يمكن أن أتأكد من صحة هذه الحقائق وشكرا um, I, I, I think that it's important to make sure that you have uh, proper and correct sourcing uh, in other words where are you getting your information from um, as I said before whenever I'm giving a report I don't, I don't write many stories I mean my work is on the air um, and so when I pick up the microphone, I want to be able to say with confidence, I spoke to so-and-so and he or she told me this. So uh, sometimes in news, um, you may find a lot of people who are getting information from sources that they cannot say the name. They have to say, you know, I've talked to two or three sources to verify this story. That's kind of a news thing. In sports, for me, I want to be able to speak, come all directly to an athlete or a coach or a manager or someone in the Federation to get actual facts. Maybe if you don't have the direct connection to someone personally, you may have to use a wire service quote. So you may have a story that you're reporting on, but you have a reputable wire service, AP, orders, whoever it may be, that is, has spoken to someone and you see those quotes that you can be sure are actual, then maybe you use that. But the closer to the actual source you can get to get the information, to then repeat it or fit it within the body of the report, that's so important. You don't want to be wrong. You don't want to be called and told that you've given an incorrect report because that stays with you. So it's a very important to, to, to try and do that, Kamal. And thank you for your question. Yeah, so what I can tell you is that uh, every time, especially for us, is important when we receive a news to control always different sources because don't forget that somebody sometimes is trying to use us. They send us the news, they tell you that this is the important news and you are a friend, uh, I give you this news because you are important, you are the, the cleverest journalist and so on. They try to, to, to make you feel comfortable and to, to feel important, but the, most of the time they try to use, use your work. So every time you receive a news, please control, double check, with other sources. If not, you, you are in the end of somebody that perhaps uh, is using you in a cynical way, in a cynical way. Now, unfortunately, the time is over because we have two hours of, uh, of possible uh, simultaneous translation. We can continue for 15 minutes only in English or sometimes somebody can translate in Spanish or, or other things or also in Arabic. But uh, now the session officially is over with the simultaneous translation. So I hope that you have felt fine with us for these two hours. I want to thank the guest, uh, Tracy, Louis, and Luis, because the problem that we have Louis and Luis, that there was this very similar name, and so it was difficult to understand to, want, to whom to address the, the question. I think that we have had with us a great professional. And uh, next week, no, from tomorrow, there will be the tutorial because tomorrow there will be the Arabic language tutorial. I don't know if uh, you of the Arabic word, you can tell us when is the Aid because they told me that they will decide tonight when is the finish of the Ramadan, the official finish of Ramadan, if it's tomorrow night or the day after because we, we still now we don't know, but after we, we will have the, uh, the English session on Thursday and after on Friday, we will have still the, the French and the, the Spanish session. So I thank you very much for your presence today because it's very interesting also for us to know everything. I want to, uh, to thank our staff that has worked uh, very well to prepare everything. And I think that uh, you can agree on this, yes or not? You agree? Absolutely. I would like that now we'll rise the end, the women that are present, because we cannot know exactly every time how many women are with us, because we have seen that there are a lot of women. 
please, the man is better that they take away their, their hand horizon. And I would like to see who are the women. Alexandru, there are a lot of women there, but they don't be shy. Raise your hand so we can understand how many women are in. Now raise the hand on, on the screen. There is the end coming, coming. How many would we are? Man? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Oh. You are more, you are more women. And also, if, if you show yourself, it's nice. Hello. Yeah. From which country? There is also an IPS from which country? <laughs> it's IPS, but we didn't know the IPS. Alam, Akosua, Ashan from Yemen. Anyway, Senegal, Dioconda, Gunai, Celine. Go ahead. Who else? I've seen more before. Gunai from Azerbaijan. Luca. Ioma. Fotumata. So there are a lot. Now I change the glasses. If not, I cannot read the names. <laughs> Steffi. Katiadut. Traore. Eranayo. Maritza, Katrina, ciao from Namibia. And Yusra from Indonesia. It's important because it's a lot of time that to, we have not any more Novirant over there. We have to, to begin again the system in, uh, over there. Where are the other girls? There are some others, but uh, Come out with, with your face also, with your smile especially. No, Ivan, you are not a woman. I can see it. Alam, how are you from Yemen? Nice to meet you. Look how many different country and different culture. It's important this, it's very important that we can have all these women from different uh, tradition, different way. No, it's a very nice picture, this. Azerbaijan, two of Azerbaijan, Gunai and Vinoves, Vinovse. It's a lot of time that is many years ago we came to Baku for the Congress. Daniel, the yes, moment five years ago. 30, more than 30 raised their hands from the, our ladies out of 170 participants at this moment. But we reached up to 210 people a uh, few minutes before. Yeah, because we went over the 200, 210, and it was a very good number. So girls, uh, I think that we, we can be together very soon, everybody of you, for the tutorials. And after next week, when we will speak about gender and transgender, because it's a very delicate uh, situation about what we will speak, because we will be one the topic of the summer. So thanks to everybody and uh, see you soon. And I ask only to the, to the mentors to stay in because we have to speak for the future. Tracy, thank you. Look how many women around the world you have. No? What it's kind wonderful. of audience? Eh? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> it's really something special. Something really special. Yeah. And I think, I hope that you have enjoyed this afternoon as we have enjoyed. And so, girls and boys, see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Louis. Thank, thank you, everybody. Louis, thank you, everybody. Louis, Louis and Louis. And have a nice day. And we continue to Bye, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Take ciao, care. Luis. Take care. Ciao. ciao. I, I hope that you enjoy. Let, I hope that you enjoy. Let's get in touch, Tracy, okay?
Yes. Okay. I would love to do that. All the best, everybody. All the best. Bye -bye. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you for the question. Okay. Ciao, man. Bye -bye. Ciao.